We're doing things a little bit different in confirmation class this year. We begin our time in small groups with the students engaging in a passage of scripture in a group of six to eight people. The Bible passage is read and then the students are invited to share their reactions and their insights so that our confirmation program might be more fully integrated into the life of the rest of the congregation. We're reading the gospel lesson for the coming Sunday, which means that this was the lesson that our confirmation students studied this past Wednesday. Wow. This is not the passage that I would have chosen to begin confirmation. Yet it's a passage that our students could dig into. They see up close and personal the marriages of their parents and other adults around them, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And so you can imagine that our students had lots of questions about the specifics of this passage. What did Jesus mean when he said divorce is not lawful? Is it sinful? What is adultery? Is it a sin when divorced people get remarried? What does the two become one flesh mean? What the students demonstrate, and it is probably true for all of us, is that when this passage is read in church, we tend to hear it in an intensely personal way. This is particularly true, I suspect, if you or someone close to you has gone through a divorce. And so we end up hearing this passage as directed to particular individuals who end up feeling ashamed or angry or hurt or embarrassed. A woman once told her pastor upon hearing this passage read in church that it felt like having someone dump garbage all over her. It didn't matter how cleaned up she got and how she put on her Sunday best. After hearing these words, she could not get the stink of her divorce off of her. But what if Jesus did not address these words to individuals? and especially individuals who have undergone the pain of divorce. Pay attention to how Mark sets up this scene. Some Pharisees came to Jesus to test him and said, is it lawful? Did you catch that? This doesn't begin as a conversation about love or marriage or divorce. It's a test, and it's not even a test about divorce, but about the law. There were in the religious leadership of Palestine several competing schools of thought about the legality of divorce. The question was not whether divorce was legal, everybody agreed on that, but rather under what circumstances. And so with this question slash test, the Pharisees are trying to pin Jesus down, trying to label him, trying to put him into one camp or the other. And Jesus will have none of it. He deflects their question away from matters of the law and turns it instead to matters of relationship and to God's hope that our relationships are more than legal matters. Relationships help us to have and to share the abundant life that God intends. And I think that's why Jesus then turns to Genesis. Questions of marriage and divorce are not simply matters of legal niceties. They are about the Creator's intention that we live in relationships of mutual dependence and love and help. And in fact, Jesus goes one step further. Divorce had turned into a legal convenience for the man. Yes, the man. Only the man could initiate a divorce in first century Palestine. And so he pushes the religious leaders to see that this law Indeed, all of God's law is intended to protect the vulnerable. When a woman was divorced, she lost virtually everything, status and reputation, economic stability, everything. And so how can they regard this as a matter of convenience, Jesus asked, let alone a matter of debating topic? God's law is meant to protect the vulnerable. And every time we use God's law to beat someone over the head with it, we are twisting it from the Creator's plan. Jesus is making a statement about the kind of community the church is going to be. 
He's inviting us to imagine communities that are centered around relationships, relationships built on the bedrock of love and mutual dependence, maintained by respect and dignity, and pursued for the sake of the health of the community and the protection of the vulnerable. And so at the risk of sounding like a broken record, let me say it one more time. Even though the discussion has been on the surface about divorce, there's something much more important going on underneath. And if you doubt the truth of that, then notice that Jesus follows the dispute about divorce with a rebuke to his disciples who are impatient because people are bringing children to Jesus. Now recall the context. Jesus has announced his intention to go to Jerusalem to die, and in response, his disciples argue about who's the greatest. Jesus, in turn, tells them that to be great is to serve, and that at the very heart of the kingdom is about welcoming the vulnerable. In fact, he says that whenever you welcome and honor a child, one who had the least status and the least power, you are welcoming and honoring Jesus himself. Some folks are bringing, Jesus, bringing their children to Jesus to be blessed, and the disciples try to keep them away. Jesus intervenes forcefully saying that welcoming the kingdom means pretty much welcoming children. That is, the vulnerable, those at risk, those in need. The whole passage is about community, but not the kind of community that we have been trained to seek. It is not the community of the strong or the powerful or the wealthy. It's a community of the broken and the vulnerable. It's a community of those who know their need and who seek to be in relationship with each other because they have learned that by being honest and open in relationship with each other, they are in relationship with God, the very one who created them for each other in the first place. Do you remember that this is what the original church was all about? Do you remember what the larger ancient society said about the church? See these people, how they love one another. The church was a place for those who had been broken by life or rejected by the powerful and who came to experience God through the crucified Christ. The crucified one met these people precisely in their vulnerability, not to give them some kind of a magic potion that would protect them from harm or pain or sorrow, but to make them open to their brokenness and to the brokenness and need of those around them. That is hard. It is hard to remember and it is hard to practice. And it is particularly hard to remember in a society that adores the rugged individualist. Many of you have heard me tell the story about how several years ago I was in a tough spot. I was burned out, I was depressed, and for the first time in my life, in my mid-40s, I could not figure out how to get out of the pit that I was in. I went to see a counselor, and of the several things she suggested, she told me that what I ought to do is go back and tell the congregation council, the leaders of my congregation, what I was experiencing and that I needed their help. And I remember going away from that session thinking that she was crazy. It was one of the hardest things I ever did. I had been conditioned to pull myself up by my own bootstraps. But when I shared my pain and asked for help, it was the beginning of my healing. My brothers and sisters, I discovered, really did care deeply about me, and they became the agents for me of God's healing love. Part of being human is to be insecure, to be aware of our need. In our culture, with its preference for strength and power and independence, Many of us, unfortunately, feel embarrassed by our need. But in the community of Jesus, 
To be broken is not something to be ashamed of. To be broken is to be human. To be human is to be loved by God. To be loved by God is to be drawn together in relationship with all the others who are loved by God. Which means that our Sunday morning gatherings are the gathering of the broken and the loved of those who are hurting and those who are healing, of those who are lost and those who have been found, of those who know their need and those who seek not only to have their needs met, but have realized that in helping meet the needs of others, their own needs are in turn being met. And that is part of the vision of this community. To be a place where God is at work to heal and restore the whole of creation, not by taking away all of our problems, but by surrounding us with people who love us, who understand and who care, and who help us to discover together our potential to reach out to others with love and compassion. We are a community of the broken, the broken whom God loves and whom God is healing and the broken whom God is using to make all things new. Some of us know ourselves to be broken, and we wonder if there is such a thing as healing. Some of us are in denial, seeking relentlessly to make it on our own, even if it kills us. All of us, all of us are invited this morning to receive God's life-giving grace and love and mercy. We all are the community of the broken and the blessed.